Okay, we're going to talk about uh, the plant kingdom. So we're going to just go over some, just do like a basic overview of different groups of plants. Uh, plants are a monophyletic group, which means that it consists of a uh, common ancestor with uh, all of its descendants. So it's considered to be a good group. The defining characteristic of land plant are, or sorry, uh, plants are a chloroplast that has two membranes, but it's not the only characteristic of plants. And here's some others. You know, they have cellulose in their cell wall. Uh, they store the food as starch, and they have this thing called the alternation of uh, of generation, which we'll talk about in a second. But first, I wanted to show you this thing I came across with, from Scientific America about just some timelines. So, like for example, just to give you some perspective of time, the Earth is about four and a half billion years ago. Uh, the first cell, which is not on this list, is about maybe 3.6 to 3.7 billion years ago. That would have been bacteria. Uh, then we see uh, the first uh, photosynthesis just shortly after that. But after that, but it wasn't what we think about in terms of modern day photosynthesis. It was not photosynthesis that released uh, released oxygen. So it's a different type of, uh, of photosynthesis. We see cyanobacteria that produced oxygen about 2.7 billion years ago, and then we start to see a rise in oxygen shortly thereafter. Um, we see algae forming just over a billion years ago, and green algae about three quarters of a billion years ago. And then we see the first land plants about 475 million years ago. And if you remember, animals started to invade land around 370 to 380 million years ago. So Plants probably invaded uh, land just slightly before uh, animals did. And the vascular plants, which are plants that have a vascular system, xylem and phloem, that can get quite big, uh, came about 50 million years after the first land plants. Um, and we'll talk about different types of uh, vascular plants in a, in a moment. So... One of the things that plants do, which is quite interesting, is this thing called the uh, alternation of uh, generations, where if you think of a plant um, like a human, uh, part of the plant would be diploid, and part of it would be haploid. Now, a human is not like that. A human is all diploid. The only thing that's haploid in a human are uh, sex cells. So we do not have this thing called the alter alternation of generations, but plants do. So when you look at a plant, part of it, part of it being part of the multicellular structure of a plant, is this thing called a uh, gametophyte, which is uh, haploid. Now the gametophyte is the structure that could produce gametes, sperm and egg cells, and they can come together and fertilize to produce what's called the sporophyte, which is diploid. Now, the sporophyte can reproduce the gametophyte through meiosis, because remember meiosis that cuts the DNA in half. And you can see that over here. So the sporophyte will produce spores. Now, what a spore is, a spore is a reproductive cell that reproduces asexually. The spores are obviously haploid. So it's not the same as a seed. The seed is a diploid structure that comes after fertilization. And, and, but we'll talk about seeds and spores uh, a little bit later on. So just like land plants, uh, so just like land animals, uh, there had to be certain characteristics that had to evolve for animals to live full time on land. Like for example, they had to evolve limbs, and then they had to evolve like waterproof skin and different way to reproduce on land. Um, for example, in the water, uh, fish can release sperm, and the sperm can swim to the egg. But on land, uh, that doesn't work so well because uh, the sperm will dry out. So there's got to be internal fertilization. Uh, so there had to be a few things to to happen for for land animals to invade land. And we see the same thing with uh, land plants. Green algae is an aquatic plant. So the first plants to invade land were highly dependent on water. So they had to live in very moist environments. And if you remember, the first animals to invade land, things like amphibians, are tied heavily to water. So they're not like reptiles where they can live on land full time and lay their eggs on land full time. So we see a parallel between ha what happened with land plants and what happened with, uh, with land animals. So for example, land animals have to 
uh, evade the problem of dehydration, just like uh, land animals do. So land animals evolve this waterproof skin. Land plants evolve uh, this waxy cuticle to cut down on water loss. Furthermore, land and, uh, plants have to be able to exchange gas with the environment. They need to take in carbon dioxide. Now, in the water, there's, you don't have to worry about drying out because you're in a watery environment. So you can get the gas in and out through diffusion, through water. But if you're living on land, you have a problem. So what land plants evolve are these structures called uh, stomata. Now stomata are basically, you can see here, there's a whole bunch of stomata. This is uh, from, I believe, an onion. Uh, from an onion. And on the left, so this is not so, think about an onion. Onion is a land plant. On the left is an aquatic plant called Elodia. Now, an aquatic plant does not have to worry about losing water to its environment, but a land plant does. So, what stomata is? What a stomata is is a. It's basically two cells. So you can see here two cells that will open up. So this is the open configuration, or they will close. And the stomata allows the plants to exchange gas with their environment, which is good. But it also regulates uh, water loss because if if a plant couldn't do that, then it could really dehydrate pretty quickly in a very hot environment. So aquatic plants don't have to worry about drying out, so they don't have to evolve these structures to to uh, prevent dehydration. So here's a cladogram that uh, kind of summarizes the evolution of uh, land plants. So the first we see are the non-vascular plants. So we have the common ancestor in the bottom here. We have the green algae. And the green algae is fully aquatic. And then we have moss, which are land plants, but they're highly dependent on living in a moist environment. And then we see that those are examples of non-vascular plants. But we can see that on the right, we have the evolution of a vascular system. So things like ferns, gymnosperms, and angiosperms, they're all plants that have this vascular system. So you can see they're more closely related to each other than they are to, to moss. So with the vascular plants, we see that what defines the two groups are the whether or not they produce uh, seeds. So we can see that on the right, uh, gymnosperms and angiosperms evolved uh, seeds, and we'll talk about seeds in a, in a little bit. Now, the so far we have uh, green algae, which is an aquatic plant, where the sperm have to swim to the uh, to the egg, and we see that that mode of reproduction is still retained in the first group, which are the non-vascular plants. Where the um, they have to reside in a moist environment, and the sperm needs to swim to the to the egg. Some other things about non-vascular plants: the dominant part of the plant is the gametophyte. So the gametophyte is this structure down here. It's uh, and whenever it's haploid, and it gives rise through fertilization to the sporophyte, which is this structure that is coming out of the, you can see that's, uh, you know, growing from the gametophyte. Now, both are uh, uh, photosynthetic. Um, so the gametophyte is a very important, and it's a dominant structure of, uh, of non-vascular plants. Now, remember, they're non-vascular, so they can't get very big because they don't have the system to, move water and nutrients really high up and they don't have a supporting structure in other words not very strong or rigid so these are these non-vascular plants are typically really really small when we see vascular plants you see a transition because they have a vascular system they can move water and nutrients further up and they have a supporting structure that allows them to get bigger so you start to see uh, bigger plants. Um, now, what's similar about the first group of 
vascular plants, which are the seedless vascular plants, is that the uh, so the gametophyte here is actually smaller. It's been reduced in size, and the sporophyte is now the dominant uh, structure in the plant. So, for example, so here's uh, the gametophyte of a fern, and this is the sporophyte of a fern. However, the gametophyte can still uh, you know, uh, live independently. It can still perform photosynthesis, so it can grow um, and so what you see with the seedless vascular plants, even though the gametophyte has been reduced, it's still like an independent uh, structure. Now, the way they reproduce is still similar to moss, however. So they produce spores. Uh, these are again our, uh, these are asexual reproducing cells. They're haploid. Um, and that's what the sporophytes produce. We still have the sperm still needs to swim to the egg. Uh, so they're kind of like moss in the sense of the way, the way they reproduce, but they're also very similar to the next group, which are the vascular plants that produce seeds. So you kind of see this transition, which is what you would expect uh, in evolution. You don't just go from a non-vascular uh, seedless plant to a vascular seed plant you would expect things that are intermediate. So the next group are vascular plants that produce seeds. Now, the difference here is that we don't have a swimming sperm. We have this thing called pollen, which you're probably very uh, familiar with. Pollen is basically plant sperm, uh, but doesn't swim. It's transferred uh, differently, either through wind or through an animal. Um, these guys also produce seeds. So a seed is a diploid structure. So when the egg and pollen get together and you get fertilization, the seed is the structure that comes out. It's, it's, part of it is the embryo, so the zygote that reproduces, and part of it is the food. The seed is the structure that can last a long time. So it's, it's an advantage over the pollen, uh, sorry, over the spore. The spores typically uh, don't last very long. Seeds can last uh, many, many years. Uh, the gametophyte now is not free living, so it's highly independent on the sporophyte. It's no longer photosynthetic, so it's been dramatically more reduced in, in size. Uh, but it's still important because obviously it still produces the gametes, the sperm and the egg. So let's look at the first example of a seed vascular plant, the conifers, okay? These guys have uh, uh, basically thick needles that are pointy, so you can see that here. So the gametophyte actually are these structures, these pine cones. Those are the gametophytes. So you can see them right here, okay, and there's two different, there's the male and female part. Uh, again, they're not independent, they're not photosynthetic, uh, dramatically reduced in size. Now, conifer strategy is to produce pollen and throw it up into the air. And you get tons of this pollen that goes in the air. So if you think about seasonal allergies, this is uh, this is this could be the reason why uh, it's all the pollen that's being thrown up in the air. Uh, they're highly resistant to water loss because the leaves are not flat; they're very thick, uh, and the stomata are do a really good job of uh, protecting versus water loss. Okay. Now they do not produce flowers. Flowers are what distinguishes uh, the next group. So the next group are closely related to conifers. They both have a vascular system. They both produce pollen, okay, but and they both both produce seeds. But what's different is they have flowers and they have fruit. Now a flower is basically just a modified leaf. So over the uh, course of evolution, uh, leaves there was some genetic changes where leaves are modified into uh, flowers, and the flowers are there to attract uh, pollinators. So we know that uh, the pollinators will come by and they'll pick up pollen, and they will transfer pollen to other plants that are compatible, right, same species, and the pollen will, because that's the sperm, will uh, migrate to the ovary, and then you get fertilization. And what happens next is that in the uh, the ovary gets undergoes this transformation. 
So here in this picture, what you're seeing are seeds. So you can see the seeds. So the seeds are the little embryos. Uh, so one seed would have an embryo and it would have food for the embryo. So you can imagine that a seed is a structure that has an embryo, E, and it has food. Okay? And then you can see in this picture that there are many seeds. So this would have been the ovary of the plant. What surrounds the seeds is this fleshy uh, material. That's the fruit. That's what you would eat. Um, so the fruit is a reward. So you know, animal would eat the fruit, and then the seeds would be uh, transferred, you know, dropped off somewhere. Um, so what we find with angiosperms, even though this is the last group to evolve, uh, I can't remember the exact. It's about 200 million years ago, I believe, but it's also the most diverse and successful group. And the reason is because they produce the flowers to uh, to attract the pollinators. So. It's not wind pollination. The pollination is much more successful. However, it does come at a cost because you got to make nectar to entice the pollinators. And they make the fruit. Okay. So these two adaptations are really, really important for these uh, flowering plants. Um, and they have, and, and, and you know, they're, because of these two adaptations, uh, angiosperms have become this very, very important and diverse uh, group. So that uh, is a very brief uh, survey. Yes, by the way, cactus is a flowering plant. Okay, that is a very, very brief survey of the uh, plant kingdom. That is it. The end.